Hi YouTube, this is Mike, also known as the Wizard of Odds, and in this video I'm going to be teaching you how to analyze the game of Baccarat. I already have a lot of other videos explaining how to analyze games like Craps, Sickbo, and Kino, which can be easily analyzed in Excel. However, Baccarat is too complicated for Excel to be analyzed easily, so I think it's going to be more appropriate to write a program to analyze it. And if that scares you off, don't necessarily leave yet. I am going to try to explain in plain, simple English what my program is doing as I go. So this video might be useful for the, the amateur programmer to maybe see how I do things and help you get ideas for how to analyze Baccarat or similar games. And if you have never written a line of code in your life, I think this might be educational to show you that computer programming really isn't that complicated. It's just telling the computer to execute a bunch of logical steps that are very simple, like um, if something is true, then do this, and if it's not, then do that. Or looping through something and executing the same command so many times, but changing one element of the command each time. So. I'm going to be doing this in C++ and the compiler is Visual Studio and I already wrote some necessary lines of code that include some libraries. I'm not going to get too into this, but um, I just copy and paste this code that you already see into every program just to get it going, just to make it work. So let's, let's make sure that everything is kosher so far. So I'm going to write a line that just says, hello, YouTube. And let's see if that works. So I'm compiling it now, and now let's execute it. There, you can, let me move it down. You can see at the top here, it says, hello, YouTube, which is what I told the program to do. So let's get rid of that and analyze some Baccarat. So first I'm gonna declare some variables. This video is going to assume that you already know the rules of Baccarat. And if you do, you should know that the player hand can get up to three cards and the banker hand can get up to three cards. So I'm going to call P1, P2, and P3 the three individual player cards and B1, B2, and B3 the um, individual banker cards. Let's call P, TOT, or P total the, um, let's, let's call P total the number of points in the player hand. B, B tot will be the number of points in the banker hand. And let's see, I'm going to just declare a variable I to, because I seem to always need a variable I for just doing some simple operations. And it's gonna be really important that I keep track of the number of each rank in the shoe as I'm dealing out the cards. So you can see the deck array, that has, that's an array with 10 elements. There's gonna be one element for the number of cards of each point value. So let's let the first value, deck array, deck array zero, be equal to the number of zero point cards. So there are eight decks in Baccarat and there are 16 zero point cards in each deck. Therefore, there are gonna be 128 um, zero point cards in Baccarat. So now let's look at the point values from one to nine. So for any given point value from one to nine, there's going to be four in each deck. And there are eight decks. So there's going to be 32 of each point value other than zero in the deck. And so what this statement up here on line 13 is doing, that's saying let's cycle through a value of i from one to nine going up one at a time. So it's gonna go i equals one, i equals two, i equals three, and so on up to nine. And then it's going, this, this command right here on line 14, that is saying in that value of the array, put in the value 32, meaning there are 32 
cards of that value left in the deck. Okay, moving right along here. Another value I'm gonna need, I'm going to need to keep track of the number of combinations of any given situation. And a regular integer like you see up here can only go up to two to the 32nd power if I declared it unsigned or two to the 31st power minus one if I declare it unsigned. And that's gonna to be too small for some of these combinations. So this int 64 means a 64 bit integer, which can go anywhere up to two to the 64th power minus one if I declared it unsigned, but I don't need to bother doing that. So that's why, so some, some variables are going to need to have more memory to hold bigger numbers. So one of them I'm gonna call common, and that's gonna be the number of combinations of any, of any given hand. Let's call, let's, what shall we call it? We'll call player win the number of combinations where the player hand wins. Banker win will be the combinations where the banker hand wins, and tie win will be the number of hands where the tie wins. So let's now initialize these variables. So I'm going, to say, I'm going to start common at one and you'll soon see why. I'm going to start player win at zero. I'm going to start banker win at zero. And tie win at zero. So I think those are all the variables I need to declare. So now let's start writing some code to loop through all the way the cards can fall. Next, let's deal out the player's first card. That can be anything from zero to nine. So what this statement here on line 20 is saying is let's start a value, the player's first card at zero and let it go up to nine, incrementing it one at a time. And then for every value of possible value of player one, player two can have any value from zero to nine. So I'm gonna cycle through those. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for the player's third card. Now you might say, Mike, maybe the player doesn't get a third card. And I will explain, I'll address that later in the video, but I think the way I'm doing it is going to keep the sh program as short and simple as possible at the expense of doing some more calculations that are necessary. But you will later see that this whole program executes in, a, in about a second. So it's not gonna really matter to me if it executes the program in half a second or one second. If I can save my own time and create a simpler program that's less likely to have a a difficult to find bug in it. So now let's do all this same process for the banker cards. So I copied and pasted the, the player loops and I'm just changing the variables now from P to, from P to B to represent that I'm now looking at the banker cards instead of the player cards. So I've got six nested loops here because there are six cards and each of them can have a value of anything from zero to nine. So ultimately there are 1 million different possible events in Baccarat, but they have different probabilities. And um, that's why I need to properly keep track of the number of combinations as I go. So let's do that. After that first player card is dealt, I'm going to multiply the number of combinations by the number of cards left in the shoe of that value. And that's what this command right here is doing. And then I need to take out that card from the shoe. 
because the player can never get it again in that hand. Okay, and now I'm going to do that same code, but for all six cards. And now I'm going to adjust the variable names. There we go, I hope I did that correctly. Now, I don't need this, I don't need to remove the card after the very la the banker's third card. I don't need to remove it from the shoe uh, because I'm not gonna do any more calculations with the number of combinations at that point. It would be a waste of time. So now I'm ready to start writing code scoring the hand. But before I do that, as I come out of these loops, I need to put the cards back in and keep, keep the number of combinations correct. So right here, what I'm doing, after I get out of this loop for the banker's third card, I'm going to put whatever the banker's second card is back into the shoe and then divide the number of combinations by the same number that I multiplied it by before. And it's important that I do this in the correct order. And I'm doing this for all six loops. There we go. So hopefully all my loops are correct and I'm ready to start scoring the hands. Before I go on, I forgot to properly divide the number of combinations by the banker's third card after I'm done scoring the hand. So now let's score the hand. Let's say that the player's points per the rules of Baccarat is equal to the number of points in the first card plus the second card you divide it by 10 and take the remainder. And you do the same thing for the banker's initial total based on just his first two cards. So sometimes third cards will be drawn. And this is going to happen if Let's write some code here for if the player total is less than eight and the banker total is less than eight, then third cards might be drawn. The alternative is that at least one side has eight or more, in which case there's a natural involved and that freezes all drawing no further cards are drawn and whoever has the higher total wins. So let's write some code in the event of the alternative where both sides have seven or less. So first let's consider the player hand. If the player's total is less than or equal to five, then the player's total points is going to be the sum of the first three player cards Divide it by 10 and take the remainder. And if the player draws a third card, then the banker has the opportunity to draw a third card as well. And he's allowed to consider what that player's third card is in his decision, giving the banker a small positional advantage. So let's write, so write the proper code for if the banker draws a third card. One of those possible situations is the banker has two or less points with two cards. 
If he does, he always draws a third card. Doesn't matter what the player's third card is. Another situation is if the banker has three points and the player's third card is not an eight. So both those conditions have to be true and the player draws a third card. Another situation where the player draws a third card is if the banker has four points, the player's third card is in the range of two to seven. So we could say that the player's third card is greater or equal to two, and the player's third card is less than or equal to seven. So if all three of those conditions are true, a third card is drawn. Another way the banker might draw a third card is if the banker has five points and the player's third card is in the range of four to seven. And another situation is if the banker has six points and the player drew a six or seven. So that's a very important line of code. It, base, it is expressing in computer language when the player should draw, when the banker should draw a third card after the player already drew one. So hopefully I did that right. So if, all, if one of those conditions are true that I just said, then we're going to redefine the banker total as the sum of the first of all three banker cards divided by 10 and take the remainder. Otherwise, the banker is going to stick with two cards. And we already defined the banker's total with two cards up here. So we don't need to do that again. So um, let's see, what if the player's total is not five or less? In other words, it's six or seven. And we already, had, we don't need to address the situation with eight or nine because the both sides will stand with two cards if there's a natural. So let's address the situation when the banker has six or seven points in stands. Then the banker still gets an opportunity to take a first, a third card. And, and in that situation, the banker follows the same rule that the player did with a, with a um, third card. If his total is less than or equal to five, then the banker is going to include that third card in his total. So I'm saying the banker total is the sum of the three cards divided by 10 and take the remainder. And otherwise he just stands on two cards and that banker total is the two card banker score is already addressed up there. I don't need to change it. So those are the two ways that a third card could be drawn by either side. And now we just need to score the hand. So if the player total is greater than the banker total, then we're going to increment player win by the number of combinations. And if it's less, if the player total is less than the banker total, we will increment the number of banker wins. And otherwise, we will increment the number of tie wins. And I forgot to do a plus equals here. That means that we're incrementing, not replacing. Okay. So next, let's run this program and let's write some code to to show the um, results of this program. Next, I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm going to copy and paste some code that I wrote 
to print out the results in an effort to keep the video short. But so let me explain what this code is doing. Line 82 is saying, print out the number of combinations that I calculated for player wins. Line 83 is saying, print out the number of combination of banker wins. 84, the number of combinations or ways the tie can win. This variable total combin is the sum of all the combinations or the number of ways you can, the number of permutations of choosing six items out of 416 cards in a eight deck shoe. So now here I'm saying to print out the, I'm defining the player, the probabilities of the banker, player, and tie winning as the number of, for example, player wins as the number of player winning combinations divided by the all combinations. Once then I'm printing out those probabilities and then I'm declaring the expected values of all three bets. For example, the player's expected value is the probability of the player winning minus the probability of the banker winning. The, the banker's expected value is 95% of the probability of the banker winning because of that 5% commission minus the probability of the player winning. Ty's expected value is eight times the probability of the tie winning minus the probability of a tie not happening. In other words, the, the uh, banker or player winning. So let's compile this. And it compiled, so let's run it. Okay, here are our results. You can see here the number of ways the player can win, number of ways the banker can win, and the number of ways a tie can happen. And you will see these same totals on my website. And notice that the number of banker wins starts with 229 and player wins starts with 223, which goes to show that there are more ways the banker can win. Because that banker has a positional advantage being able to see the player's third card if he draws one. So here's your probability of all three possible outcomes for a player win the player wins with probability 44.6247% and so on. And here are our expected values. The player can expect to lose 1.2351% of his bet, the banker 1.0579% of his bet, and the tie much, much higher at 14.3596% of his bet. So there we go. That concludes this video. I hope you learned something from it. Thanks for making it to the end. To be honest, this may not be my most successful video ever, but um, I'm hoping the world out there is interested in this topic. And if I get enough good feedback on this and enough views, I plan to make more videos to show how to analyze casino card games that require a computer program to analyze. So thank you very much for watching this video, YouTube. Give yourselves a hand for making it to the end and hope to see you in another video. Uh, please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and or better yet, subscribe to my channel. So hope you enjoy the rest of your day.